My name is Alyssa Brolman. I am one of the fellows here at UW-Madison in addiction medicine. Um, I also work part-time as a clinical instructor at Wingra Family Medical Center, which is a residency-associated clinic here in Madison that is a federally qualified health center. Um, and I have particular interests in integrated obstetric care um, as it pertains to primary care and addiction-related services. So excited to share with you all today what I've learned. And it has been a lot, so we have a lot to get through. I will try my best. Uh, to be efficient here. So let's get started. So I have no relevant financial disclosures. However, um, I have a subtle plug that I did have a baby not too long ago. So have some shared um, experience with the patient population we'll be talking about. This is also just a way for me to show how cute she is. She's nearing six months now. Um, but this is also a moment where I can pause and kind of think about the fact that this is a fairly unique period of time in many patients' lives, um, pregnancy and kind of the um, period immediately afterwards. We we know that it's an incredibly transformative time for many patients. It can be a motivating time for behavior change. However, it can be a uniquely stressful time as well, and that has impacts and implications in terms of addiction and substance use. Um, the other thing that this reminds me of to always kind of think about is that um, this is kind of uh, that addiction and substance use can be a multi generational disease or can have multi generational impacts. And so thinking about pregnancy as kind of the coming of that next generation, we do think about this as being family-centered care. Um, it, it's just kind of things that all go through my brain when I think about this particular period um, of patients' lives. Um, so we will move on. The next slide is um, a slide I try to include in most presentations as just ground rules for myself to use uh, person-centered language when discussing uh, patients and um, substance use issues. The other thing that's important in this setting as well when thinking about pregnancies is that we cannot describe infants as having addiction. We know that infants can have physiologic dependence, uh, tolerance, withdrawal related to substance exposure while they're in the uterus, but they do not have any of the psychosocial um, uh, impacts that addiction has when we think about adult patients. So that those two terms do not go together. Um, and then the final thing that I will try my best to remind myself of throughout this presentation is historically pregnancy and throughout all the literature has been described in a very gendered way. Um, we know that certainly not everyone who is pregnant identifies as being a woman, not everyone who goes on to give birth eventually identifies as a parent or as a mother. I will try my best to use as inclusive language as possible. I ultimately do slip up and this is historically how the literature has also described things. So um, we'll just try to kind of be on the same page as, as much as possible as we move forward. Here are the objectives. Um, the kind of primary one to identify prevalence of alcohol use among pregnant patients, to assess the impacts of alcohol use on the perinatal period, as well as the neonatal and pediatric um, periods as well. We'll look at important care considerations for this unique population, both pregnant patients as well as children affected by alcohol exposed pregnancies. Um, and then we'll talk a bit at the end about some relevant resources as well as some um, policy as well that pertains to the care of patients using alcohol in pregnancy. Here are the, um, so the trajectory and we'll just kind of move forward into ep epidemiology. Um, we'll look at two particular um, data sets. The first is from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, um, which is a telephone-based survey that looks at um, multiple health behaviors and many health behaviors of adults um, that are non-institutionalized in the United States. And this um, map per, uh, shows uh, the amount of any alcohol use among reproductive age women, folks who identify as, uh, I believe, as uh, female at birth um, uh, in the year 2019. And we'll see that Wisconsin, probably as no surprise to many of us, um, scores in the highest among prevalence uh, in, when we look at statewide data. Wisconsin has about 64.3% of reproductive age uh, females uh, who are using alcohol. And then we look forward to binge drinking behaviors among women who reported any alcohol use. So this is of those women reporting alcohol use, who among them are drinking four or more drinks in a, in a day. Um, and Wisconsin, again, is on the higher side here. 39% of those who reported any alcohol use reported some degree of dr binge drinking behavior. I believe this is kind of top three of all the, the 50 states as well as um, uh, the District of Columbia.
Then we look at uh, similar uh, data from the BRFSS, um, but a slightly different time course. So looking at 2018 to 2020 data um, and looking at pregnant participants um, who are aged anywhere between 18 and 49 years um, and looking at last 30 days of reported alcohol use. And about one in seven of those pregnant U.S. adults reported current drinking of any alcohol at some point during pregnancy. 5% of all pregnant individuals reported binge drinking behaviors. That's about four out of 10 of those who reported any alcohol use during pregnancy. So when we look back to binge drinking in Wisconsin among any reproductive age uh, females, we see that's about four out of 10, 39%. That really doesn't change when we think about pregnant individuals. So it's just an interesting um, uh, perspective to have. Risk factors for any alcohol use in pregnancy based on this data include no usual health care provider, and that includes an obstetric care or a primary care provider and some degree of reported mental stress. And we do note as you kind of divide the data by trimester that in the first trimester or early pregnancy seems to be the time where there is the highest um, rate of drinking. However, it can continue in the second and third trimesters. This data is different is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which my understanding is um, a, a home-based in-person or computer-based um, survey that looks at uh, similarly adult, but also young adult population ages 12 to 44 years. Um, and they collected data on uh, last 12 months use. And it, this survey in general is focused a little bit more on kind of uh, substance use behaviors. And 41.7% of pregnant U.S. adults based on this data um, reported co-use of alcohol and at least one other substance. Again, this is, or granted, this is a little bit earlier than the data that we were looking at through the BRFSS. This is from 2015 to 2018, but I, um, and I don't have kind of more updated data, um, but I imagine this is somewhat similar, hasn't changed significantly over the last three to four years. Um, but again, so that's about four out of 10 of pregnant U.S. adults who are reporting um, uh, alcohol use along with another substance. And remember, four out of 10 is the amount that folks are, or the rates that we're seeing of binge drinking as well in pregnancy. Of those uh, patients who are reporting alcohol use during pregnancy, 30.3% of those folks are using tobacco as well. 22.2% 22 of those folks are using marijuana and 7% are, are reporting co-use of alcohol along with an opioid. So why do we care about, about alcohol use in pregnancy? And the majority of that is because of fetal considerations. Certainly we are concerned about the health of the, of the pregnant individual um, that goes throughout their lifetime, but this is a unique, unique period of time because we often say there are two patients we're worried about the fetus as well. So we'll look a little bit at um, embryology or how alcohol affects a developing fetus. And this is a lovely um, image that I um, took from Duke University, which has some nice uh, learning about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder on their website. Um, but just kind of shows that really in any trimester of pregnancy, um, alcohol exposure can correspond to some degree of, of changes that are related to how the neurons or the central nervous system, the brain, is developing over time. Um, and we also kind of see they have a nice this um, parallel on the kind of horizontal bars down in that second um, portion of the image that there are kind of important neurotransmitters that we know are involved in eventual addiction, reward, all those pathways that we think about in addiction that are also kind of um, taking form at this time as well. So we see in the first trimester that we can have some physical changes associated with alcohol exposure, including facial dysmorphology. We'll talk more about that um, when we think about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. There can be other um, physical changes that happen as well. But we start to see um, that that there is exposure in the early developing brain. So that can eventually translate into um, lower intelligence quotient scores later on in life, um, CNS dysfunction. And then as we get closer to third trimester, we're thinking about more kind of executive function um, issues uh, when there's alcohol exposure in the third trimester. And the brain is more fully developed at that time. So it kind of often um, has to do with more complex um, uh, tasks later on and, and dysfunction when we think about um, uh, CNS function later on in life. I include uh, this graph as or this, these images as well, which are drawn from an article in the Journal of Perinatology from 2012. Um, the image on the left is a reminder that um, the amniotic fluid is constantly circulating in um, inside the uterus, and that doesn't have any significant amount of like metabolic activity. We know that um, the maternal blood alcohol concentration is the same as the alcohol concentration that the fetus is exposed to, um, but the fetus uh, 
metabolizes alcohol at a much slower rate than um, the maternal liver does. There's no inherent um, alcohol um, metabolism that happens at the level of the placenta. Um, and then we know that a uh, fetus that excretes any degree of alcohol in their urine that becomes amniotic fluid, then they uh, essentially are swallowing that amniotic fluid constantly. And it's this endless cycle um, where they're kind of um, both swallowing amniotic fluid and excreting that again via the urine. And any metabolite that's still present in the amniotic fluid, they then are exposed to kind of over and over again. So the figure on the right is um, a, a, an image from this same article that looks at while maternal concentrations of alcohol can peak at a certain period of time that actually in the amniotic fluid, um, we can have a much kind of more higher level and a more prolonged level of alcohol exposure that happens at the fetal level because of this um, inherent decreased amount of metabolism that's happening by the fetus, as well as this kind of continuous cycle we think of amniotic fluid circulation. So then how do we kind of guide patients and think about determining safe quantities? And the, the party line across pretty much every organization is no known safe amount during pregnancy. So this comes from the Centers for Disease Control, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics. If you look anywhere, they will say there is no known safe amount um, during pregnancy. Um, but we know that that's kind of an abstinence-based approach. And, and while certainly we don't want to encourage patients to drink alcohol during pregnancy, it's important to at least be familiar with the data um, where we could potentially have discussions with patients from a harm reduction perspective. We think about that primarily with other substances, but it's important to think about with alcohol as well. Um, so we'll try to look at some data that kind of at least tries to answer some of these questions. This is a paper that came out of obstetrics and gynecology in 2013. There was a cohort study, a prospective cohort study that surveyed women or surveyed pregnant patients specifically at 15 weeks gestational age, and it asked them about their pre-pregnancy alcohol use as well as their first trimester alcohol use. 15 weeks gestational age is right on the cusp of entering that second trimester of pregnancy. Many folks, though not all, know that they are pregnant at this time. Um, in this study, these patients did know they were pregnant. Um, and this population was followed, again, through the pre-pregnancy and first trimester data, and then looked at some birth outcomes as well. They then separated patients into um, various groups, what they called occasional use, low use, moderate use, which I believe was up to like five to eight drinks a week, heavy uh, use, which is eight or more drinks per week, and then binge drinking um, groups. And they kind of looked at outcomes for each of those groups, and they didn't see any association between alcohol consumption in any of those groups um, with small for gestational age fetuses or neonates, spontaneous preterm birth, or preeclampsia. The reason I include that is that these are some major um, markers of maternal or infant uh, morbidity and mortality that we look at in pretty much all of the obstetric literature. Um, and so these are things that kind of are looking at just the overall health of a pregnancy. And so there was not any clear association in this um, data of first trimester alcohol use, even binge drinking or heavy use with those adverse outcomes. A lot of the other data that looks at trying to determine safe quantities in pregnancy comes from the Danish National Birth Cohort, which is a population-based telephone survey that looks at a ton of health outcomes um, in Denmark, but this specific data set looked at maternal and child data. So they identified patients who eventually became pregnant, but they obtained data from them at preconception prior to pregnancy. And then they followed them throughout their pregnancy and also did some follow up with their children at age five years. Um, and it's important to know that this is not only some maternal reported or patient reported um, data, but they also did some testing on these children as well. Whereas we look at some of the other studies and often that is more um, kind Kind of uh, chart review or uh, survey data, this is actually some, some direct testing of, of children ex affected by alcohol exposure. So they looked at an alcohol exposed group and then a comparison control group that did not have alcohol exposures. And they've had multiple studies published based on this data set. I tried to distill them as much as possible here. Um, so heavy drink, uh, heavy drinking or eight or more or uh, more than eight drinks per week, so nine or more drinks per week, was associated with something called a decreased draw a person test performance. So this is a marker of executive function in children. It measures essentially how well they can draw a stick figure. Um, it also showed that these um, children had lower attention scores as well. 
for children who were exposed to binge drinking during pregnancy, there was also signs of decreased performance on the draw a person test. But otherwise, when they looked at markers of motor function, executive functioning, intelligence and behavior, they did not see um, any association between binge drinking and uh, uh, decreased performance in those regards. Um, then they also separated um, folks into low, which is one to, I believe, one to four drinks per week and moderate five to eight drinks per week groups. And they did not see any change in intelligence quotient scores, motor function, executive functioning or behavior. However, they did did see that at five drinks or more in the first trimester, there was an association with first trimester loss. And so certainly, again, this is not to say that we should tell patients like drink during pregnancy. There's, there, you know, there's it's totally safe for you to have one to two drinks a week, but there is some at least kind of stratification of risk that I think uh, can guide discussions with patients when we think about alcohol use during pregnancy. So then thinking about pregnancy care, um, I will talk a little bit about screening tools. A lot of us are familiar with that. And then some specific kind of items uh, specific to pregnancy that are considerations that I have in the back of my mind. I realize not all of us are obstetric care providers, but they're things that I think are important for us to all consider. So um, universal screening, I'm, I'm sure we are all proponents of this, is, is recommended, including by the United States Preventative Services Task Force, including during pregnancy. When we look at ACOG or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they are also recommending uni universal screening for risky alcohol use and substance use, both before pregnancy and during pregnancy. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of universal screening um, as it uh, reduces bias that you know we're not just screening folks that we think maybe could have a, a substance use issue. We really are applying this to all patients. And so we'll look at some tools um, that specifically address uh, screening for alcohol use in pregnancy. The first is something that's called the four P's. Um, this I believe is used at UW's um, OB department visits. And it basically looks at four things, um, alcohol or substance use in the patient's parents, their partner, their past, or during their pregnancy. There is something new that's called the four P's plus, which asks a couple additional questions that kind of get at intimate partner violence risk or risk of depression, mood disorders. Um, but this is the um, kind of basics of the four P's. Um, and so if there's any positive screen here, um, I believe one or more answers of yes, then that might prompt additional um, follow-up and questions. It's important to know that this is proprietary. I believe that's why we don't kind of just uh, administer it at my, in my clinic. I think there's some fees associated with it last I checked. Then the National Institutes on Drug Abuse have uh, something that's called the NIDA Quick Screen. Um, and uh, that uh, is looking at past year use of alcohol, tobacco, um, or uh, drugs, either prescription or non-medical use of drugs. And in the case of alcohol, if anyone were to answer once or twice or above, they would that would should prompt, especially in pregnancy, additional questioning. There is a follow-up questionnaire called the NIDA Modified Assist, but that specifically looks at kind of the specifics of substance use, it, of other substance use. It doesn't look at alcohol. Um, but this is one that's recommended by ACOG. There are two other screening tools that are akin to the CAGE questionnaire. These ones are called, I, I don't know if it's TACE or TACE or, and the TWEAK. These were developed in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and were specifically designed to be used in pregnancy. They've been validated in that group. Um, you'll see below that there's some sensitivity and specificity data for identifying risky alcohol use um, when using these screening questionnaires. Um, but basically, they're asking about um, certain kind of attitudes and behaviors associated with alcohol use. Um, and if anyone were to answer or yes to any of these questions and uh, one or two um, answers should probably prompt in pregnancy additional um, uh, additional follow-up. And then for adolescents and young adults, the best evidence is with the CRAFT questionnaire. Um, CRAFT stands for behaviors uh, that surround substance use, including getting into a car, using um, drugs or alcohol to relax, using while alone, or forgetting things, or impacting relationships with family and friends surrounding alcohol or drug use, and have they ever gotten in trouble related to substance use. Um, it, it does ask specifically about things like synthetic marijuana, vaping, so it gets at some um, substance use that is usually, uh, that can be more specific to a pediatric or an adolescent population. It is important to know that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that this questionnaire be administered um, not face-to-face, -face, not via an interview, more so um, via some degree of like a, question, a written questionnaire, so that might kind of improve patient comfort with some degree of disclosure. So 
kind of to summarize with screening, we recommend it, that it be universal. There's varying screening tools, some of which have been have better data in pregnancy than others. But regardless, any kind of positive result on a screening test should prompt at least additional discussion with that patient and um, might kind of prompt discussions about safe limits in pregnancy. The other thing that I'll um, briefly touch on is folic acid. This is encouraged in all pregnancies to reduce the risk of a neural tube defect, meaning an abnormal formation of the brain or the spinal cord. I have an image to the right that shows something in particular called spina bifida. Um, it's most important to use prior um, to many people knowing that they're pregnant, usually within the first four weeks of a pregnancy. Um, so we recommend for many reproductive age patients who are not on um, regular contraception that they be taking a prenatal vitamin so that they're getting a regular amount of folic acid daily. There is concern that some patients are at higher risk for a neural tube defect, so we recommend a higher dose of folate, four milligram daily, so we give someone separate folic acid outside of a prenatal vitamin. Um, and I. I've listed a couple things here that the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the CDC, recommends um, to be considerations for that higher dose of uh, folic acid. But I'd like to add alcohol use disorder to that consideration, and maybe even someone who's kind of uh, has some degree of risky alcohol use behaviors. The reason being that we know that folks who have alcohol use disorder are at risk of folate deficiency, both due to the fact that they may not be having enough dietary intake of folate, as well as the fact that they are at risk of malabsorptive conditions that can impact their ability to absorb folate. So I have not seen this mentioned in the literature as something that should be thought of in pregnancy, but it's something that kind of is on my mind if um, I'm seeing a patient who has some degree of alcohol use or um, issues with alcohol during pregnancy. And then the final note on pregnancy care um, is about antenatal surveillance. So this is something that's usually done in the third trimester for many pregnancies where there's either some maternal or fetal condition that puts the pregnancy at risk of an adverse outcome. And usually what that at least kind of in its most basic component entails is something called a non-stress test where we watch uh, the fetus's heart rate for 20 minutes and make sure that there are signs of a healthy pregnancy, including a normal heart rate and that there's something uh, that shows that the uh, fetus is reactive to various stimuli. And so it's important to know that ACOG recommends that at five or more drinks per week of alcohol that uh, patients start undergoing this testing at 36 weeks or, or, or late preterm um, in their pregnancy. And so this should be something that should be on the mind of any obstetric care provider as thinking about what monitoring uh, needs to happen based on um, the risk factors of that particular pregnancy, including substance use. You'll see the poly substance use is individualized and you'll see varying practices in that regard. Um, so this gets into the meat of some things, including management of alcohol use disorder during pregnancy. Um, I will say that this, there is not a ton of data that is out there. I tried to kind of compile what I could, especially surrounding medications for alcohol use disorder. Um, but we'll, we'll just talk about what I found and some other thoughts that I have that are running around in my mind. Um, so the first is there was a Cochrane review back in 2009, specifically looking at medications for alcohol use disorder in pregnancy, and probably as no surprise to many of us, there were none of these studies met any inclusion criteria, and they said that there needs to be high quality research to determine the effectiveness of these uh, interventions of pharmacologic medication based interventions in pregnant patients. Um, so not a ton of information from that Cochrane review. Uh, notably, the American Psychiatry Association did release a practice guideline in 2018 that has some specific guidance surrounding pregnancy. This is a practice guideline that was for management of all of alcohol use disorders, but had a specific section on pregnancy. And they mentioned that pharmacologic treatments, meaning medications, should not be used unless treating for acute alcohol withdrawal or unless a co-occurring disorder exists. And I imagine that might be something along the lines of um, uh, mental health uh, diagnoses. Their primary citation for this recommendation is a book called Drugs and Pre Pregnancy and Lactation that was published in 2017. And we'll look at some of the information from that textbook in just a moment. Um, but this is kind of the blanket statement that they have out there. And I don't really see a lot of other statements that say otherwise. And this um, practice guideline is cited in a lot of other, other places that this is kind of the guidance that medications um, should potentially not be used for alcohol use disorder in pregnancy. 
More recently in 2021, there was an article released in the journal Drugs um, that was a narrative review of some of the data, um, both animal and human data surrounding medications for alcohol use disorder in pregnancy. Um, so I'd like to compare that data to the Briggs textbook information and just to try to kind of uh, inform some of the thoughts surrounding medications. Um, this article does also acknowledge, as pretty much everything else that, that's out there does, that there is very limited data and further study that is needed in this particular uh, patient population, which we know is identified as a vulnerable population, which often kind of complicates, um, appropriately, I think, complicates uh, research studies because we want to make sure that we're not doing undue harm to a pregnancy. So we'll look at um, specifically acamprostate and naltrexone. Um, the first, uh, Kelty, this narrative review article, looks at um, animal studies from acamprostate and mentions that they did not find anything that this was teratogenic, uh, meaning that there were abnormal formations of organs and, um, in a developing animal fetus. They also mentioned that there was some evidence of neuroprotective effects when in the presence of alcohol when acamprostate was used. There's only one human study that they um, cited, and that was notably by the same author that wrote this narrative review. And they looked at a retrospective population uh, that was uh, a group of acamprosate exposed pregnancies versus community non-exposed pregnancies, um, as well as acamprosate exposed pregnancies versus those who were exposed to alcohol. Um, and in terms of acamprosate versus the community controls, there was no difference in outcomes, including uh, maternal admissions in the perinatal period, um, I believe preterm birth, small birth weight, a, a couple other of those kind of major markers of maternal morbidity and infant morbidity and mortality. And then when they looked at acamprosate um, exposed versus alcohol exposed pregnancies, they didn't see any um, significant difference in, in major outcomes except for fewer perinatal hospital admissions um, in the acamprosate group when compared to alcohol um, exposed. And then when we look at the Briggs textbook, again, this is what's cited by the American Psychiatry Association. They mentioned some data that, it, that this is teratogenic in rats, meaning form abnormal formation of um, organs in rat fetuses, at, and at specifically at doses equivalent to the maximum human uh, recommended daily dose. Um, and then in, in terms of human data that they report, there is a registry in France that specifically looks at um, potential for birth out, um, out, abnormal birth outcomes. And they mentioned 18 pregnancies that were exposed to acamprosate in, in this particular registry um, and really said that they couldn't make any particular conclusions about these particular pregnancies because there was concomitant alcohol and drug exposure, which limited the interpretation of the data and there was no um, control group. So con conclusions from each of those, the Kelty um, uh, article says that the risks associated with the acamprosate are likely to be less than the risk associated with alcohol exposure. And the Briggs um, textbooks comes to a similar conclusion. The risk benefit ratio may favor the use of acamprosate. So again, that's a little bit different uh, than what is kind of the guidelines put forth through those APA guidelines that we were talking about before that discouraged any use of this medication in pregnancy. We'll look at naltrexone as well, That the Kelty article, again, that narrative review, that in terms of the animal data that they looked at, they found no evidence of abnormal organ formation. Um, in terms of, uh, they did find data that looked at early fetal loss at doses that were way higher than we would be administering to humans, five to 18 times the human dose in rats and in rabbits, um, and some evidence of larger birth weight and organ weight. Um, however, this was at higher doses, and when they kind of compared to lower doses, they, they did not find that, and in fact, they might have found the inverse. And the only kind of mention in terms of human data that comes out of the Kelty article is that there's a growing body of evidence of the safety of this medication for management of opioid use disorder, um, but nothing specific to alcohol use disorder. And then when we look at the Briggs um, textbook from 2017, again, that is what's cited by the APA, the American Psychiatry Association. In terms of the animal data that they present, they present similar data um, to the, or to similar kind of uh, summary that Kelty does in terms of animal data. They mention uh, increased pseudo-pregnancy, so like uh, manifestations and symptoms of pregnancy without a physiologic pregnancy in rats, as well as reduced fertility that seems to be perhaps related to decreased um, rate of mating or mating behaviors. They also mention some animal data uh, that uh, looks at delayed maternal behavior and sheep that have been exposed to naltrexone in pregnancy. So uh, kind of 
greater time after a, a newborn sheep is born, but before the mom starts licking and bleeding, which I think are, are, are signs of, of kind of maternal care. Um, and then they mentioned possible alteration of opioid receptors and activity in a developing fetus, but I, I didn't find the specific kind of data or the study that, that uh, mentioned that. And then in terms of the human literature that they cite, um, they specifically cite ones that are related to reproductive endocrinology, where naltrexone, it seems like, was part of protocols to help kind of induce um, uh, ovulation or fertilization. Uh, it was kind of above my, my head, but regardless, not for the management of alcohol use disorder. And in many, in those cases, naltrexone was stopped in early pregnancy after pregnancy was established. So what conclusions then do these um, articles come to? For Kelty, the narrative review, they say the same thing that they did for, for a campersate, that the risks associated with the use of naltrexone are likely to be less than the risk associated with alcohol exposure. Um, however, Briggs says that there is potential for behavioral alteration in humans, I think because of this concern about alteration of the opioid receptor, and this, it cannot be assessed because of lack of data and concern is warranted. All that is to say is that, you know, these are two, two we don't have a ton of data, two uh, articles that have somewhat nuanced, I think, interpretations. And then we have a guideline and consensus statement from a, a major organization that says, absolutely not, these me medications should not be used in pregnancy. And I don't say that we should be using this medication willy-nilly in pregnancy, but I think it warrants a risk-benefit discussion, especially if someone um, has had benefit from this medication in the past, perhaps prior to pregnancy, or is really struggling with alcohol use. Um, certainly, it would be remiss with focusing solely on medications. And so this is some data that's looking at psychosocial intervention. This is a Cochrane review from 2015 that included, um, that looked at specifically at the setting of outpatient treatment programs and looked at interventions for both drugs and alcohol use, so kind of lumped those together. Um, they did mention low to moderate quality evidence due to inconsistent reporting of confounders, as well as inconsistent reporting of maternal and infant outcomes. Um, however, they did summarize uh, findings of a motivational interviewing um, based intervention versus controls or a contingency management intervention versus controls. Um, they did find that in the contingency management group of data that there were, that was associated with a shorter newborn hospitalization, but otherwise in both the motivational interviewing interventions and contingency management interventions, they did not find a significant difference in ma many of those kind of major morbidity outcomes, including preterm birth, low birth weight, and maternal treatment retention or abstinence from substances. Um, all of that is to say that the conclusions they came to are similar to the conclusions in many of these uh, articles with it, whereas where um, they're saying that it's important to develop a better evidence uh, base. The other considerations I'll just kind of briefly touch on is that um, there isn't a ton of um, information out there about management of withdrawal, of alcohol withdrawal during pregnancy. Um, I did find one article from General Hospital Psychiatry um, that mentioned that we should be doing using CWA scoring and benzodiazepines, which are um, pretty much standard of care um, in most hospital settings for management of acute withdrawal. They mention uh, potentially considering chlordiazepoxide in the first trimester as opposed to other benzodiazepines and using lorazepam in the third trimester as opposed to other benzodiazepines, but did not find or did not cite specific data um, or literature to support those things. I think those were kind of uh, based on just kind of academic thoughts. Um, and then uh, uh, in terms of kind of other thoughts that I have, I just wanted to kind of mention that we should be thinking about, again, both patients. So if we're managing acute withdrawal um, in the uh, pregnant patient, we should be thinking about, do we need to have fetal monitoring? Do we need to have additional cardiorespiratory monitoring? Because anytime that we're affecting the maternal circulation, the maternal delivery of oxygen um, to the fetus, we're potentially uh, affecting uh, fetal outcomes. And I will just kind of put in a plug for a caution with clonidine. I don't have data that specifically says this, but we know that clonidine affects hem hemodynamics. It is often used um, in management of alcohol withdrawal for um, autonomic symptoms, for management of high blood pressure, um, among other things. Um, but we know that, that that can affect hemodynamics and then again, the, de the delivery of blood to the fetus. And so that's something that I personally, if, if I were managing a pregnant patient for alcohol withdrawal, I would feel um, quite cautious with using. And then we know that many patients who use alcohol can have abnormal liver function testing. Um, however, abnormal liver function uh, test results are also used for the diagnosis of certain particularly um, uh, serious 
pregnancy conditions, including preeclampsia, as well as HELP syndrome. And so it is probably important when patients are reporting some degree of alcohol use in early pregnancy to get some degree of baseline testing and to use that as a jumping off point where, where do you need to have serial testing to monitor these things in order to kind of guide if they are, if you're worried about a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, or if you're worried about a return to alcohol use, um, having that information might be more helpful in this patient population than, uh, or you might benefit from serially monitoring that more frequently than you would in another patient population. Okay, moving on. Um, we'll look a little bit at alcohol use during lactation and some data on medications for alcohol use disorder as they relate um, to lactation as well. So the majority of the, medic of the information that's out there is from an amazing database that the, the National Institutes of Health has on um, the safety of drugs and, and while patients are lactating called LactMed. Um, it's easy to find online. Um, and the article surrounding alcohol use is, is very extensive. It mentions that alcohol consumption during lactation has been associated with altered growth, some altered sleep changes, including a, um, a change in the proportion of REM sleep that the, this is all in the growing infant. Um, some changes in motor development for the developing infant, um, behavior changes. There is this lore out there, um, which I wasn't really aware of um, until I started doing research for this talk, that um, some folks feel that alcohol actually increases their milk production. And um, most of the data that's out there actually shows that there is reduced milk volume production and volume consumed in patients who are um, drinking alcohol and breastfeeding or um, lactating. And I'm not sure how much of that is perhaps due to the fact that if someone is intoxicated, they may not be feeding a, a patient or an infant quite as frequently. I, I didn't kind of get into the meat of that, but that does seem to be the consensus based on that data is there's probably actually a reduction in, in um, milk volume production as opposed to an increase. The potential exception to that is actually in anything containing barley or hops, both um, alcoholic beer as well as um, non-alcoholic beer have been shown to potentially increase prolactin, which is a um, hormone in, in the body that helps produce or kind of stimulate the production of uh, breast milk. And so that is something that you'll see some people will drink like a beer or a non-alcoholic beer on, on certain days if they're worried about supply. You'll see um, folks mention that. And then the kind of effects on neurologic and developmental outcomes for folks who are, are for infants who are exposed um, to alcohol via breast milk over the long term is, is less clear. There was kind of data all over the place from this Lactamed article. And there's been particularly a lot of studies, I think, from other cultures where alcohol may be kind of a, a part of uh, kind of management of breastfeeding in ways that it maybe isn't talked about here in the United States. So a little bit more about some of the specifics surrounding lactation and alcohol use. Um, we think that the, the peak blood alcohol concentration, which also mimics the peak in the um, breast milk concentration, happens at, at about um, 30 to 60 minutes after um, a single alcoholic beverage. Pretty much every organization that you look at will recommend waiting some period of time, um, generally about two hours after an, uh, a drink containing alcohol, a standard drink containing alcohol before breastfeeding. Um, that's pretty much the party line across um, all major organizations, including the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, but below, um, what I've tried to kind of uh, talk about is, again, not to say that everyone should be drinking and breastfeeding, um, but just thinking about kind of some of the, as far as we know, the data behind why we're con concerned about this. So when someone is pregnant, the blood alcohol concentration that is experienced by the pregnant patient is pretty much almost exact to what the fetus is experiencing. They have shared blood, alcohol diffuses quickly across the placenta. Um, so they're, we think about them as being relatively the same. When we look at um, blood alcohol concentration in the lactating patient, that equals the alcohol content that is in the breast milk that is ultimately consumed by the infant. So I'll try to kind of translate this as, as best I can. I, I get tripped up every time I talk about it. A glass of wine is, uh, is usually about 10 to 12 percent alcohol by volume. Um, blood alcohol content of uh, 80 milligrams per deciliter, which is the legal limit here in Wisconsin, is equal to 0.08% alcohol by volume. So an eighth, one hundredth of a percent alcohol by volume. That is several, uh, uh, it's significantly less than in a glass of wine, we'll say that. And that is the concentration of alcohol that's ultimately consumed by an infant. So it's important to know that while there is alcohol that's present in, in breast milk at that time, it is on a, a, a very different scale than what someone 
who is drinking an alcoholic beverage experiences. That being said, we do think that uh, an, an in, infant, and especially in the newborn period, metabolizes alcohol probably at a, at a different rate than, um, than adults do. So it still is something to warrant concern, but it, it is different than it's not equal to whatever um, the person is consuming in terms of alcohol. And a lot of things that I see out there talk about that a glass of orange juice or various other juices do have some degree of inherent alcohol by volume. So it's just important to know that that's something that's out there and is discussed as well. Not that we're giving um, infants uh, orange juice in the first couple of months of life. So this is um, actually directly drawn from a group that I belong to that's of um, folks who work in healthcare who are breast or chest feeding, lactating, um, and kind of is a, a support group uh, that talks about all various kind of issues. But one thing that comes up all the time is a discussion of alcohol use and then feeding infants and lactating. Um, so oftentimes you'll hear that kind of phrase, oh, pump and dump, should I pump and discard of the breast milk because the breast milk contains alcohol and I should get rid of it. Um, so this is someone who asked, they had one glass of sangria and two, I like that they say ish tequila shots. So probably could say something closer to three or four. Um, and they're wondering if they should pump and dump or if they should save the, the breast milk for later. And here are the recommendations from this group. And I include this not to say these are medical recommendations, but um, is that like, this is kind of the, this is another uh, school of thought that's out there. And, and these are um, people who work in, in our field. Um, so someone says, my favorite saying is if you can find the baby, you can feed the baby, um, that they could pump and dilute the breast milk. So they could kind of even diminish the alcohol concentration in the breast milk further by diluting with other breast milk. Um, some. One else says, if you are sober enough to ask the question and operate the pump, then it's fine to pump and save. And the final uh, person says, just avoid anything that could compromise the baby's safety, um, including bed sharing. And I think that's where, um, it, especially if we're thinking about a harm reduction approach, this is an important thing to talk to patients about, that if they're intoxicated, that probably affects their ability to also perform some basic childcare duties. And so we should be thinking not just about the amount of alcohol that's present in breast milk um, and counseling folks on that, but also thinking about just kind of behaviors at the time of, that someone is intoxicated. Um, a final uh, kind of brief note on alcohol test strips. These are out there. People will use them to see if there's alcohol present in their breast milk. I saw a little bit of literature from this from like the dairy industry, but I don't have much to say on it outside of it. It seems like the, the, the dairy industry found that they were validated against the testing that they were used elsewhere. And I don't know the exact threshold at which this detects alcohol. Um, a brief note on um, medications for alcohol use disorder um, in the setting of lactation. There is a single study that looks at a single um, parent-infant pair in the setting of naltrexone, found that it was minimally excreted in breast milk, that RID means relative uh, infant dose, meaning kind of the amount of dose by weight that the infant is receiving compared to what the um, what the uh, pregnant patient or lactating patient is taking. Um, and they found undetectable infant serum levels of naltrexone as well as its metabolite. And Camprosate did not have any studies. Um, and then gabapentin I threw in there as well because we see it used more and more um, for management of both acute withdrawal as well as post-acute withdrawal symptoms. And that had limited information, had varying amounts that it was present in both breast milk and infant serum. Um, there were some studied infants that did not have any adverse effects reported. However, the kind of um, recommendations on the Lactamed website were to monitor for sedating effects, make sure that the infant is gaining weight appropriately, um, meeting all their developmental milestones, et cetera. So making sure that there aren't any adverse effects because we, we do see that it is present um, in breast milk. All right, moving on to neonatal and pediatric care. So we were talking primarily about the um, pregnant patient and now we'll think about a little bit more about their children. Um, I really did not find a ton of data about the management of neonatal abstinence syndrome as it relates to alcohol. We see a lot of information out there right now about um, neonatal abstinence syndrome that is specific to opioids or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. We know that infants uh, can develop tolerance to many um, substances that they're exposed to in the uterus, including things like antidepressants, including tobacco, including stimulants. Um, and I imagine that that would be the case for alcohol as well, but I just did not find a ton of even case reports that talked about neonatal abstinence syndrome. 
So thoughts, again, these are kind of just things that are going on in my head, not things that I'm basing off of any particular data, but that it should mimic care for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So some degree of kind of monitoring for um, neurologic hyperactivity, um, autonomic dysfunction, and, and that probably is similar to the monitoring we're doing for any neonatal abstinence syndrome concerns. Um, however, the current impetus in neonatal abstinence syndrome, specifically as it pertains to opioids, is really surrounding on non-pharmacologic care. So feeding the infant, consoling the infant, keeping the infant skin to skin. And while those things are incredibly important and I cannot overstate them enough, I do not think that they would provide seizure prophylaxis if we really were concerned about the risk of seizures in an infant. So, um, and would there need to then be benzodiazepines that are, um, that are on board? Again, I, I don't really have additional kind of information on this, but these are just things that come to mind that certainly if we are um, concerned about alcohol withdrawal in a pregnant patient, we may need to also be concerned about alcohol withdrawal or an abstinence syndrome um, in a, a newborn. Now we'll look at fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. This is, FASD is currently not, it's not necessarily a clinical diagnosis. It's actually an umbrella term that's used to um, encompass several diagnoses that are recognized um, uh, by the DSM. The one that we'll focus the most on is fecal, fetal alcohol syndrome. There's also something that's called partial fetal alcohol fetal alcohol syndrome that has kind of some features, but not all of FAS. And then there are some other um, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and behavioral disorders associated with alcohol use. It's important to know that um, this affects uh, a lot of people um, in, our, in our world. It's estimated that FASD affects one in four in the foster care system, anywhere between 10% to 20% of um, uh, kids and adolescents that are involved in the juvenile correctional system could be affected by FASD. So it's pretty significant. Um, we also see a term that's called alcohol-related birth defects um, that uh, used to be under this umbrella, is my understanding, but is no longer or is kind of falling out of favor as being a part of the FASD umbrella of diagnoses because it's really kind of uh, physical changes that are associated with alcohol use, things like cardiac um, septal defects, musculoskeletal changes, and certainly those are important but kind of outside the scope of what we'll talk about today, but not necessarily falling under this um, FASD umbrella anymore. Fetal alcohol syndrome is important to, to recognize because it is the number one cause of preventable intellectual disability in the United States. Um, it's uh, diagnosed primarily based on uh, uh, some degree of facial dysmorphology. You'll see some features that are um, there on the right-hand side. There's also evidence of some degree of neuro and de developmental um, abnormalities, including some degree of brain dysfunction that eventually kind of uh, manifests in other behavioral impairments, attention, executive functioning, memory, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, most uh, will also be affected by some degree of a growth deficiency where either their height or their weight will be less than 10 percent expected um, for their age. Um, alcohol use is not required for the diagnosis, which I, I think is, is interesting. Um, I'm not sure I would feel comfortable um, unless I really kind of had uh, significant um, physical exam findings that really spoke to fetal alcohol um, syndrome. And then even then, it's probably worth a conversation with the patient and the mom in a very kind of supportive um, way to, to better understand whether or not there could have been any potential exposure to alcohol use in pregnancy. Um, this is from the AAFP, American Academy of Family Physicians, that does um, mention that the diagnosis of FAS is based on clinical characteristics. It does not require the confirmed use of alcohol during pregnancy. And then the important second uh, uh, bullet point is what I think is most important, that we should be referring these uh kids and adults if we diagnose this to additional testing, because that can help qualify, number one, give them a diagnosis that helps make sense for them, and number two, helps connect them with resources that can be really important to their care. Speaking of resources, I will not go through these. I'm going to probably breeze past them because I'm seeing time. Um, there is something that's called the Choices Intervention. It's available on the CDC's website. It's got some good data behind it, and it's an intervention program that's specifically looking at reproductive age, non-pregnant females who are drinking at risky levels. There's guides about how to implement this in your clinic, and um, it has some evidence uh, that it reduced the risk of alcohol-exposed pregnancies versus usual care. So um, certainly feel free to look that up on the CDC's website if you have interest in implementing it in your own setting.
These are several um, provider education resources from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC. Um, Boston Medical College also has a three-part podcast that's available that I haven't made it all the way through yet. Um, and then I am trying my best to uh, listen to these Wisconsin Connect Echo um, sessions that are happening once monthly through the Center for Urban Population Health um, uh, and through UW-Milwaukee as well. Um, some pregnancy and recovery resources, I would certainly be remiss with not talking about these. Circle of Hope and Recovering Mothers Anonymous are born out of um, some of the national organizations for management of fetal alcohol spectrum and their support groups and 12-step groups um, associated with supporting um, pregnant or recently pregnant patients who um, are in recovery or interested in recovery um, as it pertains to alcohol. More locally, Safe Communities has a pregnancy uh, a program called Pregnancy to Recovery, where they connect a patient with both a recovery coach who often is a doula as well. It seems to be mostly focused on management of opioid use disorder, but probably think important to think about regardless for patients locally. And then I just included um, two additional um, local doula groups here who uh, Roots for Change speaks specifically to mostly to the Latinx community and Harambe Village to other um, communities of color. So just thinking about kind of trying to find a home for someone's uh, pregnancy support that best speaks to their needs. This is a list of resources um, available both nationally and locally that um, pertain to the management of fecal alcohol spectrum disorder. It's important to think about early intervention services, either birth to three here locally or through the local school district if you have concerns about children who may be affected by FASD. Um, SAMHSA also has, um, as well as no, uh, FAS United, have kind of lists of providers who may be comfortable making this assessment and diagnosis. And then the last two bullet points are specifically focused around um, folks who may have uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities. Okay, last couple minutes, and I know we should have some moments for discussion. I will just include a couple uh, topics on policy that affects this care. Um, one is CARA and CAPTA. CARA stands for Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. That was uh, 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 set forth in 2016. That is a provision of the Child Abuse Protection and Treatment Act from the 70s that has had multiple amendments um, since then. The key provisions of this act is particularly surrounding that states should be reporting this data to the federal government and monitoring in some capacity. And the goal with this was to kind of hopefully decriminalize um, or um, destigmatize some of the care surrounding um, families and children affected by substance use and addiction. And so they deemed something called a plan of safe care where they it's important that the state not only address the needs of the infant um, that is affected by um, substance exposure, but also the affected parents and family members, including connecting that parent or family member with substance use treatment. There is something called CAPTA reauthorization, which is being proposed um, in the Senate currently that um, uh, uses the terms family care plan rather than plan of safe care. Um, it it uh, frames this as being a public health response as opposed to being solely the realm of a child welfare agency. Um, and then they um, are hoping to establish that each state should have a separate reporting system from abuse and neglect reporting so that if we have any concerns about substance exposure and a patient or a family that needs connection with services because of substance use concerns um, that certainly there may be some uh, abuse and neglect that is also a concern but that those are separate um, entities and, and should be reported separately. I'll do a brief kind of uh, uh, discussion of the Wisconsin Medicaid extension. Um, currently, uh, patients who are pregnant are eligible for Medicaid if they are up to 300% of the federal poverty limit. However, that drops back down to 100% of the federal poverty li limit at 60 days postpartum. Um, I would argue that the um, kind of needs of a formerly pregnant individual uh, extend well beyond two months postpartum. Currently, Wisconsin is applying for a federal white waiver to extend that to 90 days. However, the there is something um, that's being currently proposed fed on the federal level through the Senate um, uh, that is called the Federal American Rescue Plan Act, where there's advocacy to extend um, any Medicaid coverage for any formerly pregnant individual to 12 months postpartum. And then finally, this is um, a, a current uh, federal a bill that's going through the legislature and the federal level um, that's called the FASD Respect Act that's just advocating for some additional funding and services, centers of excellence um, for care of uh, individuals and families affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So those are just kind of important to know that they're out there. Um, I'd like to thank 
everyone. That's kind of it. Uh, that's a lot. Um, I would like to thank everyone on faculty and including particularly Kelly Egan, who thankfully reviewed my slides and helped me significantly. Heather Williams is always a really wonderful um, administrative support for us. Uh, and then uh, I felt that the Wisconsin Connect Echo Series has been really helpful for me and just kind of staying in, in tune with substance use issues as they pertain to pregnant patients and their families. And here's a cute little photo of some members of my family who are um, my supports as well, including uh, 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 my dog, Maxine, who sat with me yesterday as I reviewed my slides. And I have a number of citations, but we'll go back to the thank you page uh, and take any questions. I realize we don't have a ton of time. Thanks a lot, Alyssa, a lot of great information. Thanks for pulling all that together and the resources as well. I'd be interested to, to dig more into some of those. If you didn't see in the chat, Alyssa, because I know your your view of that was obstructed, Dr. Bluestein also put in a resource around uh, sort of non-beer, non non-alcoholic non beer hop preparations during lactation. In oh. case you want to pull that up and have a peek at that. Wonderful. That's um I actually uh will drink uh, I found during pregnancy that hops and uh uh like soda water was for some reason helped me with nausea. So uh, yeah, I, I will definitely look at that regardless, just to learn a little bit more about it. 